How you going? Hey, my latest guest on the Pod 20 was someone that was uh, a lot of fun to talk to because, you know, up until I started doing audio books from here in the wardrobe, most of the books I read were biographies because I'm interested in people with amazing stories. And if you've written it down, you've usually got a good story to tell. I spoke to Tom Fordyce, who you've probably heard on that Peter Crouch podcast. He's the driving force behind that. He's an interesting person himself who's had an amazing life and met some amazing people. And he's got these podcasts out at the moment, Death of a Rock Star, Death of a Sports Star, and they really go into the life and death of some pretty incredible and iconic people. And so he talked to me about that. He talked to me about the, the process of making these and some of the other stuff that he's been up to and his background. And he really was great to talk to after listening to him on that Peter Crouch podcast a lot. And then finally talking to him, you can see he's the real deal. He's a good guy and he's really trying to do something with podcasts from the UK. He agrees with me that we're a little, still a little bit behind the US, particularly with narrative podcasts. And uh, he's trying to do his thing and change that. And it was great to speak to him. This is my chat with Tom Fordyce. You probably, well, you're best known to me for your work on the Peter Crouch podcast. Can we start with that? How did that all come about? Yeah, it's, it, it feels a long time ago now, Graham. Although, how long how long have we been doing it for? A couple of years. We've done four series. It started off as a relationship that I had with Pete from doing his book. You ghost wrote so his book, didn't you? I ghost wrote his book. Well, so we've done two now, and I was getting back from the chats with Pete, which we would do in the Holiday Inn at Junction 15 of the M6, super glamorous. And my partner has got no interest in football whatsoever. She just, she doesn't care, despite coming from a family of Liverpool season ticket holders. But I was getting back and I had my, the conversation recorded on my little digital dictaphone. And I was just desperate to play her bits because me and Pete were just laughing our heads off all the way through. And I just thought, this is, I knew it's going to be a good book because he's got so many good stories and he's very funny. And I just thought, this is just a podcast. This is absolutely a podcast. And particularly the way we did the book, which was that each chapter is episodic. So it's, you know, it's what we based the podcast on as well. You just thought he's got so many stories and there is so much stuff about football now in terms of deep dive analysis into stats and all the rest of it. But no one actually asks the questions like, well, who, who decides who sits where on the team bus? Yeah. All what, the stuff. What's that it like actually, to be a footballer? Yeah. What it is actually like to be a footballer. So it just started off as, and Pete had never heard of, of really a podcast, didn't listen to them. So I sort of said to Pete, well, look, I think this would be a good way of selling the book. Give us a go. And the BBC were really open to it. And it just snowballed really quickly. And it's this strange thing now where, because it's the three of us sitting in the pub in ordinary times and having three or four pints and chatting away for two, three hours, it feels... I mean, that feels quite small scale, but it also feels like something you do in your social life. So it's quite weird seeing how big it's become. You how know, much seeing... alcohol is then, how much is alcohol a part <laughs> of the process? <laughs> I think it's as much a part of the process as it would be with any good conversation on a night out. You could do it without booze, but it's the three of us catching up once a week and sitting around and, uh, yeah, just always asking Pete what he's been up to because he's always been up to something strange. And then slightly, me and Chris, slightly taking the mickey out of footballers' lives. Yeah. But the beautiful thing about Pete is that despite the fact that he has played for England at World Cups and he's a multi-millionaire footballer, he still looks at football like Chris and I look at football. And it's that ability, I think, to have a foot in both camps. He can, he can, you know, he can, he can want to spend 50 grand on a slide for his house, but he can also realise that, that is truly ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so it's been a joy from start to finish that podcast and it is really nice. You know what it's like when you do podcasts and you can do podcasts that you love and they get an okay audience and there can be podcasts you think are okay and they, they get bigger. So it's it's a really nice thing when something you all in, enjoy doing is, is, is enjoyed by so many other people too. And how's lockdown affected it? Because you've not been in the pub, have you? No, so we did a special lockdown series, which was a challenge because... Uh, 
we were used to looking at each other and we were used to feeding off each other and it's as you know as we know from doing this conversation it's all very very different doing it on whatever whether it's zoom or skype or anything else but actually we got into the groove of it quite quickly and we were doing two a week and we all had the room where we'd go and do it and it became a little bit like our own personal pubs we'd all have a drink while we were doing it and we'd do one a week where we were talking about the strange things that were going on and, and one a week where we'd try and have a guest and actually it was really it was really good doing it in a different way um and it seemed to work for people particularly in that first part of lockdown when it was all really strange and everyone was feeling a bit discombobulated it seemed to uh seemed to help cheer people up as well which is a good thing well let's find out about you what's your background whereabouts did you grow up so I grew up on the sort of Hertfordshire Essex border. So I was born in Harlow, mm -hmm. which is one of the, the new towns um, that sprung up outside London, the sort of post-war period, and then moved up the road to Bishop's Dortford. And then I've lived all over, really. I lived uh, in Cambridge, in Peterborough, in Cardiff, lived in London for 10 years. I now live in Cheshire, just south of Manchester. Um, and for me, I was always a writer, first of all, before I was a broadcaster. I was the BBC chief sports writer for 10 years. Um, I've ghostwritten books for not only Crouchy, but for Garrett Thomas, the Tour de France winner for Jamie Redknapp, for Chris Gale, the Jamaican uh, West Indies cricketer, Alistair and Johnny Brownlee, the Olympic triathletes, uh, Laura Trott and Jason Kenny. So I've always done sort of majored in writing, but then that gradually developed into broadcasting in my time at the BBC. And I would uh, do podcast, I had a podcast about cycling. I would help present Five Live Sport. Um, jump up on the Rugby Union Weekly podcast, which is another big podcast for the BBC, and that all led me quite naturally, really, into doing the Crouchy one. So how did you go, how did you get your first kind of start as a writer then? In some ways, I was really lucky, Graham. I was at college, and I knew I wanted to be a journalist, but I didn't know any journalists, and I had no idea at all how you would get in. And then there was an advert, and in those days it was a, an advert in the media section of The Guardian. So we're going back to about 95 here. And it was, you know, the famous advert that the enemy put out for hip young gunslingers, which is what got Tony Parsons and, and uh, Julie Birchall working for enemy. There was a sort of football equivalent of that, which was Match Football Magazine, which is a kids' football magazine. A lot of people who, who were into football as kids will remember Match and Shoot. Mm. And they put an advert out for writers and they stipulated you do not need any experience. This is about the ideas you come up with, not the fact that you might have done match reports for the Daily Mirror for 15, 20 years. And the editor was quite an enlightened guy called Chris Hunt, who had come from the fanzine style of the side of the business. He then worked for a magazine called Hip Hop Connection. So quite a sort of edgy, different stuff. And I just had, because I was obsessed with football and I'd read Match and Shoot as a kid, I sent him 10, 12 ideas. He then said to me, look, come on in, try some work experience. He paid me for work experience, Graham, which no one else was doing at that time, <laughs> which meant that I could do it because otherwise, how can you do work experience? I had to go and live in Peterborough. I didn't have money to, you know, to get a bed and breakfast for a week. So he paid me a freelance rate. And then I got on a journalism course at Cardiff, which was one of the original ones, did that for a year and pay for that with the freelance stuff that I was doing for Match. So I would, in those days, it was a fax, crazy enough, it sounds like ancient history, but I would fax in ideas every Monday morning. And then they would go, yeah, do that one, don't do that one, yeah, like that one, like that one. And I would type them up and send them in. You're in the game, you're in the environment. I, was, I, had, my, I had my foot in the door, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how did that lead to the work at the BBC? So I worked for Match uh, across the summer of Euro 96, which is obviously massively exciting for football fans. And then, because Match was doing really well at that time, they launched a, uh, a sort of general sports version of Max, Match. Uh, so it was across all different sports. And I was the I was given the writing gig on that. From that, I progressed to Features Writer for Total Sport, which was a adult sports magazine. And then when the BBC were looking to, to bring in some uh, experienced writers to the BBC Sport website as that was developing, I got the shout and joined them then. Um, so I was one of the first ones out of my colleagues who made the jump from print, which was dominant then, into into new media. And how much of an adjustment was that? Because writing for radio is, or for broadcasting is different to writing for print. Mm. Yeah, it, it was a good transition. It was that, I think some of the fundamentals are the same. I don't know if you agree, but it's well, that idea of... structure is exactly the same. You've got to know where you start in middle and, and, and where you're going to end. But just the the... You don't get the license to use the, the words you could use in print. You don't get the license to do that in broadcasting because if people miss it, they miss it. 
Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a different skill, isn't it? But I think if you if you understand, as you say, the structure, and you understand how important the intro is, and you understand pacing, then you can apply all those things. And it's also that sense of not, I think, particularly with writing scripts for for broadcasting, it's that sense of not patronising people. Whereas you can, as a writer, you can have your little niche where you can. Um, yeah, you can have your little coterie of followers who are all in on the gag, but broadcasting in, it is, it's a much wider field, isn't it? People don't like to be patronised, people don't like to be talked down to. So it's that ability, I think, I don't know what you think, that ability to connect with people and not to exclude people. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be one-to-one, but it's got to be broad, yeah. Um, it's very intimate, isn't it? It really is, yeah. It's... Uh... It's it, I I know some writers who've tried to to write stuff for for broadcast and and you have to say to them you can't say just the basics you can't say that's adjacent to you have to say it's next to yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely yeah it's just really uh, which I found it quite easy because I went to radio school in Sydney I went to the Australian Film TV and Radio School because I I was an air conditioning engineer so I didn't have a massive vocabulary anyway and they'd go to me oh your copy's really good and that's because I don't know any long words you know? <laughs> <laughs> just. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was good stuff. Now you're a sportsman yourself as well. What are you up to? I, I have very much at the the amateur end of the scale, Graham. So I, yeah, I've always done a little bit of everything. I was one of those kids who was obsessed with sports. So, what you know, depending on the time of year, I might be playing football or cricket or tennis or swimming or on my bike, and that's carried on in, into adult life. And I think in my previous job as chief sports writer at the BBC, that was a real advantage, not because I could understand what the elites were doing, because there is an enormous gulf, obviously in ability, but also experience of what you do, but because it gave me a fascination to what they were doing. So if I was talking to Crouchy, I was fascinated by that world. Or if I was speaking to, to Geraint Thomas, I could see the gap between the good amateur riders that I knew and then what the elite can, can do and, and, and the level they can consistently perform at. So it was that obsession. And if you, if you're writing or broadcasting about music, you don't have to be a an elite guitarist or drummer or singer. But I think if you have attempted it and you're into it, then it just fuels your passion for that subject. I think that's how that little relationship worked for me. I, I think, unfortunately, um, particularly in radio, there are a lot of people who talk a lot about music who have never been on a stage and done a gig in a band. And that usually annoys me. There are a lot of those kind of... I don't want to name names, but there are a lot of those kind of... Uh, well, six musicy style people who will talk as if they know what they're... And they have no idea what they're talking about. And that does bother me. So it's good that you've come from a sport background. You've at least done it at some... I mean, at some level. I mean, uh, as a triathlete, you've done all right, haven't you? <laughs> I did used to enjoy triathlon, yeah. It was. It seemed to hit that sweet spot for me as someone who used to do a lot of running but was always getting injured. Because triathlon involves three different sports, you could just train harder and not get injured. Um, so I used to really enjoy that. I used to really enjoy triathlon. And uh, there was a camaraderie with triathlon as well that I found. You, you'll be familiar with if you ever watched the London Marathon on TV. And when the the, the sort of the mass field are coming through the finish line, there, there were always hugs and tears and everything else between the different runners because they all understand what each other has gone through. It's a little bit like that with triathlon. You've all, you know, you've, you've swum your 1500 meters in a lake or a river or whatever it is, and you've pushed yourself so hard on your bike that you feel sick. And then you've done this 10 kilometer run when you've got absolutely nothing left in the tank. So there was a lovely camaraderie about it as well. And that was really, that was how I got into, when I talk about doing the uh, ghost in the book for Alistair and Johnny Brownlee, who uh, world champions, Olympic champions at triathlon, that gave me so much interest in what they were doing because it's still quite an arcane sport triathlon. It gave me a real fascination with what they were doing. It also meant that when I was doing the book, because a lot of the time ghosting a book for someone is like doing a real in-depth interview with someone if you're broadcasting. You have to create that bond and you have to create that level of trust. And what I found was good with, with Alistair and Johnny was I could head off with them on their long four-hour bike ride and we could have a chat on that and chew things over. And then when we got back and they would be ready to eat an enormous meal because they'd also done a big swim session and a run session that day, then we would chat about the things that we talked about on the bike ride in a slightly more... Um, controlled environment so we could record it all and yeah it really worked as a, as a bond I think between us well let's talk about the the current podcasts can we start with death of a rock star this is this is fascinating I mean it literally is a, it's a, a narrative style podcast in the ilk of 
um, This American Life or that kind of, it's that style, which is a style that in the UK we don't do as much of as, as you know, PBS in America. Has, they've kind of set the standard for that. Why did you decide to talk about dead rock stars or the deaths of famous rock stars? Yeah, it's... I think the first thing is we wanted to do, as you say, this sort of thing isn't really being done in Britain at the moment. And we felt that we wanted to bring, I suppose, a level of quality with, with the writing, with the voicing and the production. So that these each of these shows would be a, a, a mini documentary, but also in that half hour, because I'm only writing 4,000 odd words, which is, which is nothing if you're talking about the life and death of a, of a famous musician. It was it was telling people parts of the story they didn't know. It was casting a fresh perspective on a life that might feel otherwise quite familiar. And then it was utilising these these brilliant voiceover artists that we use and the production to create a really immersive experience. Because as you said, like most podcasts in the UK, I think we are, you know what you think, maybe two, three years behind America. Yeah, definitely. We're we're a bit we're a bit stuck at the moment, aren't we, on this celebrity interview celebrity idea. Now when those are done well, they're brilliant and they're a heaps of great examples we could both name but we just wanted to try something a bit different and i found them hugely satisfying to do because each of them presents a challenge mm. if you're doing otis redding or if you're doing bob marley or if you're doing karen carpenter which parts of their life do you choose to talk about which parts of their life do you choose to ignore because say four thousand words half an hour of podcast is not a great deal what sources do you use how do you start to write for the particular voiceover artist who's going to be doing them? How do you satisfy the obsessive fans? So if I'm writing about George Michael, how do you write something that the people who have read everything about George Michael and seen all the seen him in concert tw 10, 20 times and bought all the singles and the albums, how do you keep them happy, but also pull in someone who might not like George Michael, who might just go, yeah, Wham well, weren't ready for me. and I didn't really like his solo stuff. How do you pull those listeners in as well? So they've been a they've been a real pleasure to do, um, because they're all they're all so different. They're all so different. Trying to find a structure, as we said earlier, a way in, a fresh intro, a fresh angle, and then purely from selfish reasons, Graham, as the guy writing them or as someone writing a lot of them, there's quite a, a magical moment for me when I first hear the voiceover artist perform. This is before the production's been put in place, and it's like someone's taken my words and just doubled their effectiveness because. Emma Clark and Elroy Spoonface Powell and Tom Price, who are reading them, are so good that they just transform my words. It's actually quite an emotional experience, you know. So do you give them notes ahead of time or do they just look at the raw words? I'll give them a little steer, but what I, what I, I find is that you can... This is almost where my ghosting experience comes in, because when you're ghosting a book for someone, you just get a sense of someone's cadence, how they speak and the words they use. And I'm finding the same with the voiceover, the three voiceover artists, is that I can hear Emma or Spoon or Tom in my head and I can write for them. I can put it in phrases and the cadence that they would use. So it's been a really interesting... Look, I'm obsessed with music anyway. I grew up obsessed with sport and music. So each week, doing for me, doing a deep dive into someone's life that I was either interested in or perversely thinking, well, I'm not really into George Michael or Whitney Houston. Am I going to enjoy this? And then a week later, finding that I'm just listening to George Michael four or five hours a day because I'm so into it. <laughs> I'm listening to like weird B-sides and I'm like listening to 12 inch versions of stuff because I've got so much into their their character and their life. Who was the one that surprised you the most? You thought you, you kind of had them worked out and then they turned out to be totally different. Oh, that's a really good question. The George Michael one was one where I, I, I wasn't the age I was growing up. Wham were for girls. We know when I was nine or ten, Wham were for girls. They weren't for boys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I never owned any George Michael. And I knew that he was meant to be a really likable guy. And then I read and read, read all the books about him, watched films and you know listened to all his music. And I just had a real affection for him by the end. This this sort of immigrant son who'd grown up as sort of a chubby kid with glasses and bad hair who turned himself into this absolute teenage heartthrob. A guy who was an unbelievably good songwriter. I don't think I'd appreciated that before. And then also his voice. I don't think I'd appreciated how good his voice was before, how, how good his phrasing was, how he could take an ordinary line and just transform it in the way that Stevie Wonder can, take an ordinary line and just transform it. 
And he just came across as a lovely guy who was always honest or trying to be honest to who he was. He was honest about his failings and he did have his failings. And in the end, sort of found a certain peace, even with a lifestyle that some other people couldn't understand. And I think that's another thing I found with all of these, because they will all end the same way, because we are dealing with rock stars who have died young or tragically, is that I've left each of them with a sense of sadness, but also a sense of sympathy, I think, to the person they were and what they went through. Um, certainly with the, the Keith Flint one, who's obviously the lead singer of The Prodigy, and that was my era and I did like The Prodigy. But the contrast between his stage persona and the sort of moral panic there was when Firestarter came out and the sort of things he would do for people and the sort of man he was, I just, I, there's not a single one where I haven't liked him by the end, Graham, if that makes sense. Who was the most tragic? Or that oh. you found the most tragic? The Karen Carpenter story is just a heartbreaker. It is just an absolute heartbreaker. I don't know if you like. I don't like the Carpenters' music. But All I, I know about them is it was brother and sister, Richard and Karen. Richard Richard ended up with some problems with pills, and That's Karen it. was anorexic. But uh, uh, oh, and she had an incredible voice. Oh, Above voice. that, I, I don't know much at all. Well, it she was a drummer a... originally, I think, wasn't she? That's right. Yeah, she was a drummer. So when they were growing up, they had a very controlling mother, which I think was one of the problems. And Richard, who's the elder of the two siblings, was considered the genius. He was a, he was a brilliant pianist. And it seemed that all the family's love and energy went into Richard. And when it was Karen's voice that, that broke them, when it was Karen's voice that everyone wanted to talk about, and that caused problems for everyone else, this, this very strange controlling dynamic and when you hear her sing, because the, the songs are quite syrupy for me, the Carpenters, you know, they're, they're... It was middle of the road stuff. Yeah. yeah, it was, wasn't it? And I enjoyed setting their music in the cultural context. The fact that the 60s had been about rebellion and feedback on guitars and Hendrix and Woodstock and fighting in the street. And the 70s politically are, are a reaction to all that, aren't they? Nixon comes into the White House and it's sort of, it's a throwback. And the music of the Carpenters absolutely fits into that. This sort of harking back to a to an era which may not even existed, but a safe era where, the, where pop stars aren't threatening and they look like the kids next door and they, they don't do bad things. They don't smoke and take drugs. Well, obviously the irony of that is that Nixon would, <laughs> would end up being impeached and that Richard Carpenter was addicted to, to sedatives, to qualities. And then you have Karen in all this who feels like a lost soul, who sings in a way that almost no one else can sing, who can take these very syrupy songs and turn them into something far more powerful and yet is in the grip of an eating disorder at a point where people don't understand eating disorders where she doesn't understand it and where her weight is plummeting and everyone around her is just telling her to eat which doesn't work and there's a powerlessness about it about how she deals with it about how her family deals with it and the privations that she goes through as that eating disorder takes hold in terms of how she's starving herself how she's purging herself it was it was really hard to to read about, but in a strange way, you'll understand this. It was satisfying to to write about and and hearing that one voiced up, which is out in a couple of weeks. Hearing that one voiced up was really emotional because we don't have all the answers. You know, you'd like to go back and help her and say, look, this is what we now know about eating disorders. Because now they, almost... they they talk about that that it's it's for some people. I don't know all. I don't know anything about this, but. I've heard it said that it's for some people who have it, it, it's something they can control, that they feel like everything else in their life is out of control, but this is something they'll control and they just get hooked on that and it becomes everything. Did you get the, that feeling from her? Yeah, absolutely. So her mother had always tried to control everything that Karen did. Her brother was controlled her mother everything. a narcissist, do you think? Quite possibly. Quite possibly. I think she was also of that generation of, of Americans or adults who clearly loved her children but couldn't say it there's a, there's a heartbreaking scene that we refer to in the pod where karen is about six stone and she's um her psychologist has asked for a meeting with the family and the psychologist starts off by saying i just think we all need to say that you we all need to say that we love karen and her brother reacts almost angrily and says well of course i love you and then her mother just goes we don't say that sort of things where i come from and it's an absolute heartbreaker when this this poor woman is six stone and she's dying in front of their eyes and they react like that. So I think you're right. It is about control. Her food was the one thing she could control. Her brother controlled the music. She couldn't control 
uh, her fame and her mother tried to control where she lived, where the money went, who she dated, who she married. So it's a really sad story, but in the way that these sad stories can come time, sometimes feel to us, it's actually quite a comforting thing because when you hear her music and you get an understanding of it, you do feel this enormous warmth towards her. Mm. Mm. Michael Hutchins, it was, mm. coroner said it was suicide, but I think Paula Yates said that she didn't think it was. Um, what Did you end up with an opinion on that? There were so many different voices, and I suppose you will get this when someone dies alone. There's the, the auto-asphyxiation yeah. theory. Yeah. I think the most pivotal thing that happened in the build-up to that and probably explains why it ended as it did for, for Michael Hutchins was the time where he's in Denmark with Helena Christensen, who he was dating before he, he dated Paul Yates, and he got into a fight with a taxi driver. The taxi driver punched him and he fell and hit his head. And it sounds like he suffered, in retrospect, it sounds like he suffered some sort of traumatic brain injury at that point because his band members in, in excess talk about how his character changed and his mood swings became much more intense. Didn't he lose a uh, sense of taste or smell? One that, of the... That's it, that's yeah. it, yeah. yeah. And he was never really the same man again because he had been, he was such a natural performer, wasn't he? He was a natural mm, he was a rock star. front man. Yeah, <laughs> absolute, absolute stereotypical rock star. And things seemed to get more difficult for him after that and I think that's why he was chasing different highs and he was he was chasing different relationships um it was also the shock I think of that death because his bandmates were waiting they were doing um rehearsing just down the road uh in Melbourne and they were ready to go back on tour and they were waiting for him to turn up and then a camera crew arrived and said what do you think about Michael and they said well, what do you mean and the camera crew had heard first and for everyone involved, there was that sense of, could they have done something? Yeah. Uh, he had, a, he had an, an old friend, an old female friend who'd been with him for much of the evening. Um, Paulie Yates was back in was back in England because she was looking after her kids with Bob Geldof. But there was a sense of guilt for everyone involved, for the bandmates, for the partners, for the friends, all, all of them thinking, should we have seen this coming? Was there anything that we could have done? Hmm. But do you think that it was deliberate or when was it suicide or accident i think it was an accident Re okay. reading everything about it i think it was probably an accident yeah an accident um, waiting to happen probably but an accident yes the same. I, yeah. I think so i think if he had wanted to kill himself i think there were other ways he could have killed himself yeah um, and other opportunities and other times one more before we move on to the next podcast <laughs> because this is a fascinating subject for me marvin gay what the hell happened there shot by his dad yeah, shot by his dad. So I, I've always the joke. The joke is like the worst advice Marvin Gaye ever got was from his mother when she said it wouldn't kill you to visit your father now and again, which is yeah. pretty tasteless joke. But they were estranged, weren't they? But, I, yeah, I his father what... was a, his father was a very complicated man, wasn't he? He was a, a sort of preacher, but also a, a, he cross dressed in his private life. And Marvin Gaye had had this strange career, hadn't he? Where he'd wanted to be a crooner at the start of his career, and then he'd had all his hits with Motown where he had sort of the more upbeat stuff. And then he'd had that complete change of his career with what's going on, where he'd yeah. become, become almost like a sort of social campaigner. And it's an it's still an incredible album. It's what, 1971 that came out, didn't it? And it's yeah. still, for me, it's still as powerful as it was when well, I first, what, heard, I first are, heard For it. me, there are, there are two big songs from, from about that time, and, and they are um, What's Been Going On, and then, of course, Sam Cooke. Um, change is going to come. I think those yeah. two are the, the same kind of. The, there was something going on, and they tapped into that. And yeah, Marvin Gaye was 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 one of those. Yeah. Yeah, I think he was one of those who. So he died in 1984. Uh, so he was in one of those strange sort of mid 80s career hiatuses that a lot of the 60s stars had, where they hadn't adjusted to musical taste changing, and they still had that cachet, but people hadn't really rediscovered them. They weren't being deified as as they would be if they survived until the, the 90s or the noughties. Yeah. Um, but I wonder with Marvin Gaye what, what he would have gone on to achieve because his voice is still there. Yeah. He still has that incredible voice where he can do the deep growly stuff, but he can do the high falsetto stuff. There's an amazing clip that you might have seen, Graham, which, which always blows my mind, which is you can find it on YouTube, and it's Marvin Gaye singing I Heard It Through the Grapevine, and they've stripped out everything else but his vocal. So if you search for Marvin Gaye, heard it through the grapevine vocal. Yeah, I'll only, check that. I haven't heard that. It's no. the most extraordinary vocal performance 
when you hear just the vo- the voice on its own the, the tricks he's doing and the the way he's using his voice the way he can make it sound angry and sad and happy and melancholic almost in the same lyric it's an extraordinary thing to hear well what went on there how come he ended up getting shot by his dad then well, that's one of the ones that we we haven't released yet, and it's one of the ones that I've planned oh. but not not written. So, oh, I see. So that one's only just that one's to come up. Oh, that well, there's a nice teaser then, because that yeah. one is a, a a total mystery. Was Michael Hutchins the only mystery? As was it uh, deliver? I mean, you know, there are others. Karen Carpenter, we know how, how she went. I see, and George Michael too. But okay, so you've still got to investigate that. All right. Well, let's move on to uh, Death of a Sports Star. So mm. first of all, what was the major difference that you found? Oh, unless it was a similar thing between if you could if you could lump them together between the way sports stars go and the way rock stars go or is is there the commonality there because the you know fame and everything yeah i think it's around how you live your life so most sports stars live their life in a much cleaner way There's, there tends to be less substance abuse less less um, alcohol abuse so for some of the sports stars it's it's almost a greater shock when they die because you can see it in the lifestyle of some of the rock stars you know, Michael Hutchins was, you know, he was using quite a lot of drugs. He'd always experimented quite a lot. And we, you know, in retrospect, you could see what was happening to Karen Carpenter. And Keith Flint had had a troubled background. But with some of these sports stars, it's it's different. You know, you can't see, you can't see the, the beginning of the descent. Um, and I think it's also the way that, that the similarities between the two are the way that they make us feel. So, Sports stars give us those ecstatic moments, don't they? Where if you're a football fan or a cricket fan or whatever it is, a rugby fan, you're watching someone else who can totally transform your mood. Mm. Someone scores a goal, takes a catch, does a try. You're jumping around, you're waving your arms in the air and you're hugging your best mates. And that doesn't happen. You know, that, that power that those individuals have is something pretty intense. And musicians have it to a certain extent in that they can change our mood when we listen to their songs. They can decide the way we dress can't they if we're really into a band and a look when we're younger but i think with sports stars it's that intensity a a musician gives you a sense of over listening to an album or watching in concert but but a sports star has that ability to transform your mood like that you're thinking about striker who bangs in a goal or you know john alomu who who's arguably the most important rugby player of all time when he when he runs a try and he's got four million people in New Zealand all jumping to their feet, screaming and, and cheering. Mm. So it's an incredibly powerful thing. And I think for us, if we can tap into that, if we can tap into how people felt about those sports stars and maybe the shock around their deaths, but also just as with Rockstar, trying to tell them stuff they might not have known. So with John Alomi, for example, most people in the street would be able to say John Alomi, yeah, big rugby player, big guy, fast used to run through other players like they were Skittles. But there was so much beneath the surface that maybe people didn't know about his his childhood, how he grew up in Tonga, um, how rough and tough it was for him in his teens, you know, growing up in a part of South Auckland which where there were a lot of gangs, where he was running with the wrong sort, where he was involved in, you know, he would beat kids up and attack kids with and get attacked himself with knives and bottles, how troubled he was, how his dad used to physically abuse him, and how he came through all of that to become, yeah, to probably make a bigger impact than any other rugby player in history. And yet at the same time, he had this degenerative kidney disease that meant when you saw him on the pitch, he was always unstoppable. He was bigger and stronger than anyone else. He could smash his way through tackles. Yet his body was doing something to him which would render him unable to walk, unable to unable to, to get around unaided. So it's that it's that sort of duality, I think. It's it's the stuff the headline stuff that people might know, and then it's saying, did you know this about them? And if you didn't, again, hopefully, when you get to the end of this pod, you're going to care about this person more than you cared about them before, and you'll feel a sympathy for them, I think, and an understanding of of how they lived their life, and maybe some of the mistakes they made as well, because we didn't want this series, series to be salacious. We didn't want it to be about scandal. It's got to feel sympathetic and warm. And if you know the person... You've got to finish the podcast thinking, I feel like I know them better now. And if you didn't know them, you've got to finish it thinking, wow, what a fascinating person. Did you actually meet any of the people that you ended up making a podcast That's about a after question. their death? Yeah, so I certainly met John Lomu and then um, Marco Pantani, the cyclist, which is a, a really sad story. I covered his cycling career. And, and this was a, this was a 
absolute heartbreak of a story, Graham. So he was a, a lot of people are driven into sport and music, aren't they? Because they're running away from something else. They feel they have to prove something to someone. And Marco Pantani, who was an Italian cyclist, didn't look like a sporting superstar. He lost all his hair very early. He had sticking out ears. He had a broken nose. He was small. And he was an incredible climber. He could just, he could ascend mountains quicker than anyone else. But when it went wrong for him, he just, his descent, his metaphorical descent was probably faster and longer than anyone else's as well. He got... What happened with him? So he was he was competing in that era where there was a, there was a lot of abuse of performance enhancing drugs and he was one of the few who got caught and he became a scapegoat for it and he, but they were all up to it yeah well so well, they were all up to it but yeah obviously we know with the Lance Armstrong thing that it was right. yes yeah exactly and Lance got away with it for a long time and kept winning and Pantani didn't and just couldn't cope with the disgrace that he was in and started abusing cocaine had a lot of money got into a dreadful cocaine addiction was using crack cocaine ended up dying of a cocaine overdose in a desolate seaside town in February, only half an hour away from his family home where his mother was. So this sporting superstar died alone um, on the brink of madness in this lonely hotel in an empty seaside resort in Italy. It's, it's an absolutely heartbreaking story. And when you met him, what stage was he in? in his he, was at the peak, he was at the peak of his powers then. So he was a, a hero in Italy because he'd won the Tour de France, he'd won the Giro d'Italia, the two biggest races he could have won. He had this gold hoop, hooped earring, Graham, and he, he had a, a bandana. And they used to call him the pirate, Il Pirata. That's what they called him in Italy. And he used to come out with these wonderful quotes that people said, Don't, why don't you wear a helmet? Surely it's better to wear a helmet, you're much safer. And he would say things like, helmets imprison my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very poetic way of speaking, very Italian poetic way of speaking. So he was someone, Pantani, I think, and hopefully you get the sense listening to the, to the pod with this one, that even while you condemn his abuse of performance enhancing drugs, you do feel this great sympathy towards him. You get a sense of why he did what he did, how he ended up, and you see the world from his perspective a little bit. Did you get emotional in any way, having actually met him at the peak? then having yeah. to then do the program about where he ended up yeah absolutely absolutely and, and it's been like that with the, the the musical stars as well the otis redding one i always loved otis redding and writing about otis redding's death at 26 in this plane crash just when he's on the point of becoming a superstar just when he's done the monterey festival and he's breaking through yeah because as a kid i used to listen to otis and i used to think what if what if he, i mean 26 is, is no time to die is it 26 is you're only just getting started as a musician yeah. And it's I think those are the things which have which have touched me the most. It's the sense of lives left unfinished. Yeah. What they could have done. Well, Death of a Sports Star, you do Kobe Bryant as well. It's oh, a helicopter no. crash, wasn't it? I mean, we we weren't as familiar with, with American basketball when he went. How how big a deal was that in America then, to, to put it into perspective? Was it like us losing a, a top premiership football player suddenly? It's probably almost a sort of a David Beckham. Wow. I think wow. It's, that, it's that big because he had been at the top for a long time. He had joined the NBA, the professional league, as a, a straight out of high school, which people didn't do at that point. So he'd been in the spotlight from the age of 18. He was an incredible player. He could be a very selfish player. He'd gone through quite a big arc in terms of starting off as maybe a selfish, self-centred player and then gone through some dark places and come almost full circle. Uh, and has started becoming a huge advocate for women's sport through his daughter, Gianna, who was, a, who was a fantastic young basketball talent. So I think in America, the death of Kobe Bryant in January 2020, most people in America will be able to tell you where they were when they heard the news. It's, wow. it's, it's that big. He was an ab absolute superstar. And as you say, it was the shock. It was There was no warning about Kobe Bryant's death. Yeah. There was no illness in the build-up to it. There were no abuse issues. It was one minute he was, he was with, with us, and the next minute there was a helicopter crash and he'd gone. Yeah, yeah. Amazing thing. Death of a sports star and death of a rock star. Let's talk about the Joe Marler show then. Mm. Is, is this is this because you did the Crouchy one? A little bit like that, yeah. I think the, the, the thing about Crouchy is, as I said to you earlier, the thing about Crouchy is that he he is has a foot in both camps. So he can understand the sort of the madness of football while I was talking about it. And he's just very self-deprecating. He's a very British sporting hero, Crouchy, I think. He's very self-deprecating. He's very charming. He takes the mickey out of himself. And Joe's like that. Joe is self-deprecating and charming and doesn't big himself up. 
and just views the, the world in a slightly different way. And what we thought with Joe is there's, there's loads of great Buppy podcasts out there. We didn't need to do another Buppy podcast, but we wanted to put him because he's fascinated by people. He's fascinated by what makes people tick. And so am I. That's almost why I wanted to be a journalist in the first place, Graham. I knew what I thought. I wanted to know what other people thought and the lives that they led. So each week we meet a different person with an interesting job. So we've spoken to a psychopath expert. We've spoken to a zookeeper from London Zoo. We've spoken to Tim Peake, the astronaut. Michelle Rue, the chef. We've spoken to a tattoo artist. We've spoken to a stunt woman. So all these jobs and each one of them have blown us away because we've learned so much. It's it's such a fun afternoon recording that podcast. Joe so will ask stuff. It's just his curiosity ask. then that because yeah, I, mean, I think so. You know, you you've interviewed thousands of people. You know how to interview somebody. I'm just wondering why you, you teamed up with him to get him to uh, to be part of it. He Graham, he'll ask stuff that I wouldn't ask because <laughs> I'd have my sense sense my sensible journalist head on. <laughs> So he will say things like, let me think of a good example for you. Um, when we were talking to uh, Tim Peake, the astronaut, he will he will ask Tim Peake stuff like, he will say, come on, Tim, look, I don't trust anyone. How do we know that the moon landing's really happened? And as a result, he'll get a really good answer, whereas I would never ask that question because in my head I'm a serious journalist, you know, I wouldn't yeah. ask that of Tim Peake. Yeah. And he asked Tim Peake, do you believe in aliens? And again, I would have thought, no, nah, that's a silly question. It got a sensational answer because Tim Peake calmly and logically explained why well, there probably are alien life forms. Yeah. So it's that it's that ability that Joe has, and also it's just fun that the two, the two of us get on really well, and we can have a good laugh doing it, and we we sort of bounce off each other well as well. It's just been a really enjoyable way. So we record um, when we record our shows. It's a really enjoyable way to spend an afternoon. A really good fun way to spend an afternoon, and hopefully that comes across. Tell me about the Crowd Network, because this is how this has all happened then. Mm. So Crowd Network um, is set up by myself and uh, two uh, colleagues in the BBC. Um, so we set this up this year, and our aim was to use, to, to really use a lot of the lessons that we'd learned in different points of our career about what makes great audio and what makes great podcasts. And we had a vision for what the British podcast industry could be and how it might catch up with where the American podcast industry is. We're, all of us involved are, are absolutely passionate about podcasts, about writing them, about producing them, about editing them. And we just felt that this was the point. Podcasts are getting bigger all the time. And as, as you guys know at Podcast Radio, there is an explosion in a number of podcasts. Some of them are great, some of them are less great, but this is the, this is the coming world. You know, audio on demand is the coming world. And we felt that right now was the, the point where we wanted to immerse ourselves more fully in it. We had lots of ideas for shows. Um, we've been quite ambitious with our launch strategy. So we're launching a new pod pretty much every week from the point where the company launched in, in September. We've got a great list of shows stacked up for the new year. So it's been a really exciting time. Like I say, we're all passionate about podcasts. We're all podcast listeners. We're all podcast writers or editors or producers. And we just thought this is what we want to be doing. So what's next? Well, well, there is a really good show we've, we've, we've done, which has just launched called The Mentor, which we're really excited about. So The Mentor is based on the premise that 2020 has been a pretty rubbish year. You think? For most, <laughs> for most people, hasn't it? <laughs> and we wondered what it would be like if you had someone on speed dial who was able to give you the most incredible advice. And we also wanted to do something for people from disadvantaged backgrounds, for BAME candidates. So what we've done is we've... We've got three, I won't call them kids, three young people who've had difficult years, different backgrounds, but all with their own challenges and ambitions. And we hooked them up with the mentor. And the mentor is a man called Rick Lewis, who is uh, Britain's most successful black businessman, incredibly charismatic guy who has set up any number of businesses. He runs the Black Heart Foundation as well, who is charismatic and clever and interesting and successful. So these three young people have now got 12 weeks to turn their year around. They can phone Rick whenever they want. If he is enjoying what they're doing and think it's sensible, then they can tap into a pot of £5,000 each to make their plans come off. So it's fascinating listening to these, I say the completely different backgrounds, these, these three, um, and you're listening to their stories and you're blown away by what they've gone through and what they're struggling with, but what they're still trying to do. You're fascinated by the advice Rick is doing them and how he's relating to them and how he's putting a metaphorical arm around them and steering them through it. But what you're also 
doing, I think, Graham, is you're putting yourself in their shoes and you're saying to yourself, if I'd had the disadvantages they've had, would I be where they are now? Or would I have sunk without a trace? And if, if I was in their shoes now with Rick and this potential £5,000 and I had 12 weeks, where would I get to? Mm. So that's a, that's a really good show. It's a really, really different show. It's almost like it's almost like imagine The Apprentice if you if all the candidates on The Apprentice were really likable, and if <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> rather a stretch, than, but yeah, <laughs> rather than backstabbing <laughs> maniacs. Um, <laughs> so it's that's a really good show, and that's been um, that's been one that I'm only tangentially involved in. That, that uh, Louise Gwilliam, one of our producers, is running, but it's been a lovely show to listen to and to to to, to fit to hear develop, and to try and find out where these three will end up how far they'll go you don't know how it's going to end we don't know how it's going to end yeah so that's there's, a, right. there's a new, new pod every week and they're you know this is a real life thing how are they getting on with their their 12 weeks to save their year yeah good and that was called the mentor the mentor yeah that's out now so there's the uh there's the mentor there's the joe marla show there's death of a sports star there's death of a rock star and of course there's that peter crouch podcast so yeah keeping you busy keeping very busy yeah Tom Fordyce, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time and letting me into a little bit of your world. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Graham. It's been great fun. 